talking to now to Rick Leach, who is president and CEO of GoJet Airlines. Thank you very much for speaking with me. You're welcome. You need to speak louder. You're welcome. <laughs> so what I would like to get a sense of is regional airlines are at the tightest end of the business, tightest margins, the most difficult place to trade. And as we've heard you speak on the panel today about the pilot situation, it's a, it's a business that is driven by efficiency to squeeze every cost saving you can. Between now and the next generation of airplane, how do you see this industry accomplishing that and surviving? Well, I don't know if we will be meeting the players that are in the business today, flying the 50, the 70, and the 76 seat regional jets, will be really uh, a huge player initially in the uh, new aircraft, especially the new the electric aircraft and things like that. I think those are all very interesting, and I think they're going to need to get a little larger in capacity before it might work with our business model, you know, probably. Um, or you'll have carriers like us that, that have holding companies like we do and, and others that might say, okay, we want to get into that, but in a separate in a separate zone. So I see that possibly possibly evolving. Right now, what we've got to do is get our efficiencies up today, get our production up today. We're flying so few hours per aircraft in comparison to what these models were originally built upon, and then we're burdening that with higher costs, right? With the with the skyrocketing labor costs right. due to la labor shortages in, in the market. So it continues to be a, a balance. But I, I do see over that we're going to gain on this challenge of pilot shortages that have, is affecting our efficiency in our business, which is then going to make us look more seriously at some of these beyonds. Right now, three to five years down the road is an eternity in our business. You know. And when we don't want to be left on the sidelines, this type of aircraft still has a lot of life left in it, you know, and it's going to be flying for a good long time, well overlapping with some of these new entrants. But some of the new entrants are much smaller, like a four or five passenger aircraft. And I think those have applications, uh, but more around your high dense, you know, populated regions, really, more so than the other areas where we're connecting small communities and medium-sized communities and augmenting service with the regionals throughout right. the country to the gateways to the world. So um, so it, it's a completely different application. But I, I know there's some out there that are looking at a 30-passenger right. electric aircraft, which sounds really quite interesting. I, I really want to learn a bit more on that one. I did uh, have a presentation on the Honda uh, electric aircraft. Again, these are all very interesting things, but... A lot of, a lot right. of, they're real small. Right. They're really, really small, and I, and I think they have a real application that could benefit, and and I see it evolving to that. But it's going to fill other niches that that we're sort of not focused on. Some of the region, the larger regional players today, anyway. In your in your industry, it's always been that passengers have moved away from the turboprop and the, the propeller situation to a jet. All these new airplanes yeah. were going back to props. They are, they are. Well, obviously, that's the most efficient, less emissions, all that stuff. Um, it's very odd in the U.S., you're exactly right. And for some reason, there's a major turboprop version. Um, throughout the rest of the world, that's not the case. That's not the case. The turboprop props play a very important role in, in, in the aviation sectors in those other countries. I do believe that as uh, 121 to 135, that that 30 seat and less uh, type aircraft could have a resurgence if we can get some 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 new model aircraft. Now, those are going to be more efficient, probably something in a hybrid nature. But I think that those have a place in some of these smaller communities because with the pilot shortage, we're going to need those types. You, things probably to bridge the gap. And do you think that we can foresee part of that closing the gap moving to single pilot? No. Uh, well, some of that can be done on lesser capacity 135 operations today. Um, I believe there's technologies that can make that uh, very safe. But I think that um, the traveling public on a more cabin class, larger aircraft are going to struggle 
with that decision. So it's going to have to be that much, much smaller aircraft that they almost accept that as, but as it's, a part it's, of it. It's interesting to see that technology always is ahead of the regulator. Well, right. Well, and with the regulator, I don't know why that should surprise you so much. Well, it doesn't surprise me. It just it, it, it's how it is, and how does the regulator catch up with the idea of this evolving well, look, I stuff? I think the regulator needs to catch up with a lot of things, uh, and and it, and I think the regulator needs to find a way to be somewhat agnostic or somewhat uh, neutral, and just look at facts and science and and data in a positive way instead of being this becoming po these should not be political motiva politically motivated moves or decisions and I sometimes think the regulator is sometimes influenced by things well, yeah, that they should not be they're not they can't make the very best decisions they can make unless they very candidly and honestly look at all data especially the data we have today is more than we've ever had on a lot of the that, that builds up to explain and or address and or respond to some of the challenges we face. But when there's an inability or an unwillingness to listen or or to act, really, and they'll listen, but they won't act because they're afraid to act because it's politically maybe not the well, right thing I, to do in their minds. And that's, I'm, I'm just, I'm there's gonna... a lot we can do, but we're not getting it done because there's... Uh, other dynamics that do not play into enhancing safety and all right. those things. People say it does, but it, it, it's the data doesn't it's counterintuitive. It. The data, data doesn't support it. Well, I think that we, we, we I think we, we can recognize the fact that the Boeing 737 Max situation has caused the FAA to slow down any approval of anything, mm -hmm. and so the regulator there is being exquisitely deliberate on everything. And rocking the boat is not a thing that gets rewarded if you work for the government. Uh, no, that's correct, um, and there's probably there's lots of reasons behind all of that, which we don't need to get into. But um, on, on the on the front of pilot supply or how to address some of the basic challenges that are having a material market impact on the industry throughout this country, um, there's a lot of data that's been proven and tested and tracked and quantifiable more than we've ever 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 had. And I think that there's a lot of good things that came out of the um, the, the act, the, the law that went into effect. And I'm not I'm going to call it the 1500 hour rule. I'm not saying the 1500 hours is really the thing, but, but that there's rule. a lot of peripheral things that the industry was already engaged in. And by nature of the action that 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 the Congress made, we were able to implement some things faster or get some things in place, which was great. And, and those are all very, very, very positive. But, it, the, but the bottom line is there's many ways to train a pilot in a correct way or a wrong way, and every hour is not created equal. Right. I thought that was an exquisite point when, yeah, when and, you guys spoke about yeah, it's the quality of the hour, not the, the number. It's the quantity. And, and right now, and I've spent more hours than I'd like to remember, rem remember going and speaking to congressmen and senators, and, and I am shocked by the fact that they will say, but but this is good, Rick. Why are you fighting this? They get another thousand hours of training. It's not training. You basically have to go out there and log time. Right. You're just building time. You're burning gas. You're poking holes in the sky. Quite frankly, these, these candidates who used to be just so strong in every way technically advanced, very disciplined because they came out of these really strong disciplined training programs like the Emory Riddles of the world and things like that. And there's lots of other quality training programs out there right into one of our programs, which is going to test them to their limits, challenge them more, train them harder. <clears throat> and, and now they take the disciplines that they had for those four years or five years in school and they go out and they just log time. Unlearn those things. Unlearn. They they are unlearning. It's a it's the opposite of training. And so they come to us and we're having to break habits that they never came to us with before. And we wash them out. I mean, yeah, we're short pilots, but we're for a pilot to sit in our seat, they've got to be of the highest standard. Safety, comprehension, you know, their abilities. Otherwise they're not gonna go there. But at the end of the day, we are failing 
many more than we ever, ever did because they came out of these programs and they were ready to learn more. They were a sponge. They were ready to take on the next challenge. Before that, that rule came along and right. threw everything. And, and now they're, they're out there just flying willy-nilly, uncontrolled airspace, doing things. I, I know, look, I mean, they're out there sometimes training and, 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 you know, and that kind of stuff, which is good, meaning training other pilots, which you need as a CFI, but I'm saying they still are unlearning uh, the programs that they were, that were so structured, and our programs are so structured, that when they come back to us after a year or two of burning time or building time, they're not as prepared. And, and they're sort of out of that routine. They're out of that routine. I mean, the pilot profession is a very disciplined profession. It's not a profession where someone should do it as a hobby, really. Right. You know, it, it's very unforgiving if you, if you sure. make the wrong decisions. Zero, zero tolerance. Right, there's exactly, zero tolerance. So you need that mindset from the beginning and you don't want to change that mindset. As soon as you change it, the outcomes are different. Thanks so much. You're welcome.